Well, I've been donated time to the community and uh, legislative work for the last 10 years. I mean, it's an ongoing thing uh, all the time. So I, I don't, I mean, I'm working on ter a tremendous amount of issues. Um, so it's an ongoing thing. It hasn't stopped for uh, the last 10 years. I've always been community minded, but I've dedicated a lot more time in the last 10 years to it over the first 40 years of my life. Anyway, uh, anyway, Travis Thompson, seat 1A. Can you read that again for me? Sure, absolutely. Um, the name uh, and street where you live, consecutive years in Bonnie County resident, most recent location in your last volunteer service agency. Okay, my name is Adam Rourke. I'm running for seat 1A. Uh, I live up on Pristine View up in Sable. Uh, lived here, well, my parents and I, we bought a house in 2011. Uh, I finally retired and moved here. I've been here living full time for a little over a year. Um, this year I, I'm retired, like I said. Uh, retired deputy sheriff after 26 and a half years. Uh, my, late, my last uh, volunteer vocation was with the high school where I served in Washington County, Oregon. Uh, I, w I served for eight years as a band booster parent, and of those of eight years helping out the band booster parent, being a volunteer there, uh, I was a uh, vice president and president, and part of that in involved building up the program so that the, the students were able to uh, travel from competition to competition. Uh, and we, in order to make that happen, we had to uh, do a tremendous amount of fundraising in order to uh, keep the cost low for our parents. Uh, Adam Rorick running for seat one Spencer Hutchings. I live on Westman Road out in Sagal. I'm a small business owner. I own Cheap Dog Supplies down in Sagal, the gun store. The uh, last, so I've been here since 2013, and my volunteer work is I'm the treasurer for the local Republican Central Committee. Hi, I'm Cynthia Weiss, and I'm running for the same seat as these gentlemen. I live on Upper Gold Creek Road and have for the last five years where we started a farm. My volunteerism never ends, and once I moved up here from the southern part of the state, from Ada County, I have been helping veterans, those who fall through the cracks. I help those who, who need help. It doesn't matter who it is, I do it children who are being abused, parents who are being abused by the government who's taking their children away. Whatever the need is, whatever we the people need, I'm there for all of you. Thank you. I'm also running for 1A. Dan, you want to explain to, to them what, how this goes? Okay, yeah, just so if you haven't heard, um, we'll start with Travis on question number one. It'll come all the way down to Cynthia. After Cynthia is given her one minute answer, um, Cynthia will have 30 seconds to identify potentially a position she didn't agree with on, the, on, the, on that answer. Um, and then it'll go back the opposite way uh, for 30 second rebuttals, we call it. Um, in the speed round, it's a simple answer, one, two, three an word answer, so there's no rebuttals for that round, only on the long questions. And uh, each candidate will get a turn to answer first, and again, uh, the last one to answer will be the first one to rebut, and then the rebuttal goes all the way back to the first one who answered. Okay? All right. Uh, Travis, you're up. Okay. Are we ready? Yeah. All right, this is a short question. Do you support a constitutional amendment that would allow legislative legislatures to convene when needed, when they need to, opposed to requiring the governor to call them into session? That's a question well, on the first one. Steve Brown. Yeah. All right. So um, the, there's three co Yes. No. Yes. No. Oh. Yes. Yes. You don't want to know why? No. Uh, yes. That's yes. a really good question, though. <laughs> yes. Are you talking about the state constitution or yes. the federal constitution? State. Yes. 
Okay, this is the long question. This is when you can pontificate. Okay, what is the purpose of civil government? The purpose of civil government? Uh, it's basically to mediate, me, uh, no, the purpose of civil government is to mediate the interactions amongst people and protect the rights. Everybody has their, their own constitutional rights, but those rights tend to overlap at times. Um, I guess one of the ways to describe it would be some of the warning labels you see, like hot coffee. Why would you have to put a warning label on that? Well, because somebody needed it, and then the rest of us have to suffer. So uh, what we end up doing is, is as we interact amongst ourselves, uh, different people push across the boundary of where your rights stop and another uh, and theirs uh, start. And essentially, in a nutshell, that's where our legislation comes from. Uh, see, I'm having a real hard time with my hearing today. I'm, I apologize. Okay. What is the purpose of civil government? The purpose of civil government, in my opinion, is is to uh, protect the people and ensure freedoms, ensure their freedoms, uh, and reduce the amount. Is to be limited in nature so that we're able to do what we need to do as citizens to provide for our family, to uh, move about freely in the country without any encumbrance. And so our job as being in the government is to secure those rights, the inalienable rights that we all have that are given to us by God. The government is there to secure those and protect those rights so that the people can be free. Unfortunately, uh, government is overreaching at this point and it is far overreaching and it is stifling what we can do. It is stifling our business. It is stifling how people are moving about. We're looking at mask mandates. They're, they're violating our constitutional rights left and right. 2022 is the time where we need to stand up as citizens of the United States, especially citizens of North Idaho, citizens of Idaho, and take back control of our government because our inalienable individual rights are being trampled on. And if you guys can't see that, um, you know, you just have to take a look around and look and see what Little's doing and look what Bedke's doing and some of the other legislators that are out there. That's what we need to be doing. Okay, thank you. Well, the role of the government should be to create a framework of rules that we can all live within and that reflects the desires of the populace. So we've all got a desire to, you know, have property boundaries or just there's certain rules that civil society needs to live by. Otherwise, we'd have anarchy and I don't think anybody wants anarchy. So just basically to create a framework for us to live within and uh, able to have uh, good relationships with our neighbors and not end up uh, in large disputes that are repetitive. So things that continue to be problems, the, the law, the civil government should have rules and laws around things that are continuous problems. You know, we don't want to have thievery, so we have laws that stop people from being thieves. So just create a civil society. Civil society, what a great question. Unfortunately, we have lots of laws and they've been created. Our primary one is the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution here in Idaho. Unfortunately, we do not have the freedoms and the rights that we deserve and it's going to take grassroots support from everyone here who are interested in government, but you've got to let all your neighbors know that we can't do it by ourselves. We all have to get together and get our freedom and our rights back because the people who are getting rights that we are not getting are illegal aliens who are coming here and getting our taxpayer money rights and the people who live in our state are also being denied their rights. So the purpose is for us to stop the overreach of government and make it something that we can afford. And all I can say is we have to do it together. We're not going to do it by ourselves. Thank you. 
So you can rebut anyone else's and then we'll work back the opposite way. I'm not going to rebut it this time. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the only thing I wanted to say anything about was uh, warning labels. I'm an advocate of removing all warning labels. I don't know about y'all, but when I get something, first thing I do is throw away all the warning labels. <laughs> well, I mean, that, that, I get that, I guess. But the, you know, the main purpose is, like, uh, was said that we have way too many laws. Well, we've had to have way too many things created. And we need to start backing some of those out. But politics is downstream of society. So it really takes uh, an educated public uh, to, to kind of understand that, you know, hey, we're, we're free, but we need to maintain our boundaries ourselves. That way we don't have to keep expanding these laws, but we can pull them back and live within a framework that, that we can uh, find to be acceptable. Because it is uh, really frustrating to be have a rule or a law walking through in every pass because somebody has taken advantage of that particular situation in the past. Okay. Speed round. Yes or no? And we're starting with Adam, I think. Should the 17th Amendment be repealed? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. 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 Okay. Longer question. In what way are all men created equal? Well, in what way are all men created equal? Uh, in, in my interpretation of that, uh, all men... Can you all hear me back there? Yeah. Yeah. All, all men don't just mean men. It means everyone. It means every living person, are, they're all created equal. God gave us inalienable rights, and we were all created the same. There's one man, and, and of that man was woman. That's how it all began, in the beginning. Uh, I don't see any change from that. For me, there is no uh, different difference when it comes to color, race, or nationality. All right? They have different customs, they have different beliefs, but they are all uh, this, the same man and woman in, in the creator that were made in the creator's image. So that's what it means to me. Well, uh, we were all born equally. Um, I kind of, I've had a lot of lessons in that in my life. You know, nobody, uh, people talk about somebody being born with a silver spoon in their mouth. And yeah, that happens. You know, some people have a, a nice upbringing or a favorable family or a favorable position in life when they're when they're born or when they're brought up but we all have an equal chance and all you have to do is look around and you see people who excel when they're in circumstances that people would think they would never get out of so all people are created equal we all do have an equal chance to excel and succeed it's if you have it inside you to do that some people do some people don't but we're all given the same chance we all can excel if we feel like pushing ourselves if we feel like if we feel like pushing the boundaries. Is go get a microphone? Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you hear me? No. It's on. It's on. Yeah. Hello? Yep, it's on. speak up. Speak up. Speak anyway. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Yeah. okay. Are all men and women are all men created equal? Yes, and that does include everyone. However, we do not have all the same talents. We're all born from our Creator. Didn't make us all the same. He gave us all different talents so that we can work together and create what has to happen. And it has to do with, as one of my fellow patriots has said, it has to do with us having the will and the desire and to work hard and to not let anything stand in our way. And when we fall down, we pick ourselves up and we never quit. And that's all I'm gonna say on that. So all, all man, men, but it, it means uh, mankind are created equal. And we have to, the distinction is, is that our rights come from God. They don't come from man. And we've established uh, a framework for those rights in the constitution. And the premise of our uh, 
whole government is that we are equal and, and it's, it doesn't mean we have equal outcomes. It's, it's we have equal opportunity and everybody's gonna take their talent and, and what they were given and what they have in their energy and create their own opportunity. And that's the biggest distinction between our society and other societies that are planned societies is they want forced equal outcomes and we say that we're equal and we can use the talents we have to create for ourselves. And what we create should be our own property. And that's where it comes, all men are created equal and endowed by uh, these inalienable rights, which include the rights to life, liberty, and they were gonna use the prop word property, but they changed it to the pursuit of happiness. But that's the foundation of our republic. You have rebuttal if you want it, 30 seconds. Cynthia? I'm good. Okay. Next question. Well, you're going to be busy, right? <laughs> uh, first, uh, I just want to say I'm disappointed that Mark uh, Sauter chose to drop out of what I hope will be a substantive exploration of the issues that we care about here in North Idaho. I'm surprised somebody running as a Republican is choosing not to participate in a forum sponsored by the Republican Party in our county. So thank you to the rest of you for following through and showing up, and I am looking forward to hearing what you have to say. And uh, the last group had to answer this, so what are your pronouns? No, I'm kidding. It worked, it worked so good the first time I had to do it the second time. Um, so we often judge people by the company they keep. As the saying goes, tell me who your friends are, you tell me who you are. Please name your top three donors, whether individuals or groups, and sort your answer by the amount donated. Top donor, second donor, third donor. Uh, my pronouns are attack helicopter, by the way. Anybody cares. <laughs> uh, some of you get that. Um, top donor, I think my top one is a guy named uh, Mark Taylor, and he's a friend that I've had known for a long time. He's a guy I've known for quite a few years. He's a customer in my gun store. And he's, uh, do he donated money specifically, and he's the top guy that donated to me, because I said, Mark, uh, we have a Democrat running in this race as a Republican, and the Democrat machine is dumping money on him, and I need help. And he said, how much do you need? So that's why he's my top donor. I think the other do top donor is the Idaho Stop the Rhino Pack. They've also given me a thousand bucks. And I th does anybody need an explanation of what Stop the Rhino Pack is? Um, and then I think there's a couple other people that gave me 500 bucks, and they were also uh, PACs that were uh, Republican PACs. Does that answer your question? I can't cover it all? Okay. Is it to me or that way? Uh, to you. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, are you, I need Are you it. wearing a pedometer? Get <laughs> your steps in? No, 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 it's all right. We'll get it. Hi. I do not accept money from PACs. I do not accept money from lobbyists. I only accept money from individuals. The individuals who have given to me, several of them I've never even met. They gave it to me because they heard that I believe in the Constitution and that I have the experience and the knowledge and the connections to make things happen, to stop the federal government from overreaching our state and to help our, and to be in the state legislature, I know a lot of people from down in the swamp because that's where I escaped from. So I feel that I'm in the best position to do that and I will, my top donors have given me $1,000 each and I am not going to take any group money. Thank you. So I am my top donor, and then the next <laughs> couple of uh, donors are uh, family and friends. And um, so I don't take PAC money, and I don't do with special interests, and here's why. So political PACs are, are set up to specifically solve a problem, but the problem is, is the problem is the product and they're not so inclined to solve the problem and as we've seen over the last few years the problems aren't getting solved i've spent a lot of time down at the legislature watching how this works and what happens is is that they say that they're going to solve the problem they raise money to solve the problem and then they do it in such a way now they're very complicated and then uh, 10 years of uh, understanding that it's hard to combine into a 45 second question 
but I can stake my reputation of being a longtime resident here that this is how it works and I've watched it happen. And so I won't take the, the PAC money, but they, they take the money to solve the problem. They run the problem in such a way that it can't be solved. And, and it, it's like a self-licking lollipop. It continues to go, the problems stay there, and the, the money comes and then the PACs want the candidate that's going to show the best to make it look like they're doing the work and they're not. And the candidates don't even necessarily know this. Money comes from out of state, it's funneled through the PACs and that it ends up locally. I know some of the people in the PACs, they're good people, they just don't understand how it works. And so I'm not gonna go to my friends and families and say, hey, you know, donate money when I know that it's not solving the problem, it's furthering the problem. You stole my line, I'm my top donor. <laughs> uh, I, I'm funding my campaign almost 100% by myself. Uh, but I do have a, a couple that were at it that I've known for 15 or 16 years that went to another church that I where I got baptized at they donated a thousand dollars to my campaign uh, the, the person that is helping me as far as organizing uh, her and her husband uh, donated five hundred dollars to my campaign and then I've had a couple other people that have donated a smaller nominal amounts um, I'm not really seeking donations. I'm not seeking, I'm not dialing for dollars or anything else like that. Uh, my belief is that I should put my money where my mouth is, all right? I'm out here doing this for the citizens of Boundary and Bonner County. I'm not out here to fleece anybody and make myself richer. I don't, I don't need the job and I don't need the money. It'd be nice, it'd be easier, easier, but I think you all have paid enough into our governmental system. You don't need to be spending money to try and get somebody elected. So, just be, yeah, did you, did you, you rebuttal time at all? I do. Okay, hold on. Adam? Yeah. Travis? Cynthia? Be a green light. Press left Got it. It's almost <laughs> dead though. I forgot myself. I am my largest donor. I just didn't think of myself as a donor. I just thought of myself as taking every last dime we have for emergencies and using it to try and save our country, our state, and our local government. And I do have a question. When someone up here refers to another person as a Democrat, I want to know who that is. And I, I don't think it's fair to cast aspersions on someone else unless you have proof. So I want to know, Spencer, who you're talking about who's a Democrat up here. Um, I'm not talking about anybody at this table. These are all Republican people. The person I'm talking about isn't here. He couldn't show his face here because he knew he'd get pummeled. Uh, and that's Mark Sauter. If you And don't take, don't take my word for it. Go to the SOS report for the state of Idaho. Just Google Sunshine Idaho, Sunshine Report Idaho, and look at Mark Sauter's donors. There's a lot of Democrats in there, and there's a lot of PAC money, and there's a lot of corporate money, and all his donations pretty much line up with uh, Jim Woodward and Sage Dixon. They're all getting money from pretty much the same people. So, I mean, you can draw your inferences from that. And a lot of people that are giving money to Sauter are full-on Democrats. So that's where I'm saying he's a Democrat, and I'm also my biggest donor, and Travis, you have taken PAC money, AgriPAC. Gave you a thousand bucks. Oh. Okay. Oh yeah. Oh yes, they did. That's a uh, farm barrel. So th uh, there is a. Rules. You're good. Okay. Do I get to repeat? No, 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 no. You're done. Okay. He mentioned. Did you already get a rebuttal? You already did your rebuttal. You passed on it. You, pa you passed on rebuttal. Okay. Yeah. And just to be clear on the speed round, that's supposed to be quick answers. All right. So. Uh, yeah. All right. So top three donors. So uh, my long question is this. Smearing conservatives. So far right is now a smear term increasingly used by leftists, establishment figures, and media conglomerates to demonize anyone who loves liberty and the constitutional protections we inherited from our founders. 
to steer people away from conservatism and say that conservatives are far-right nuts and knuckle-dragging bumpkins who are irresponsible and have no right to govern. Where's the middle ground in today's left-to-right political spectrum? Cynthia. Oh, it's me. Gosh. I'm sorry. I don't think there is really a middle ground right now. I think that we have been divided so efficiently by the Democrats and by really large, large companies such as Bill and McGit Bill and Melinda Gates and George Soros that they've changed all the definitions about what a person is, right or left. I'm a conservative, have been my entire life. Yet during this campaign, I have been accused of being a rhino. I have never, ever been a rhino. I think that it's really difficult to define ourselves. What we need to be thinking about is all of us conservative Republicans need to stick together and stop doing mean things to each other because it's not going to get us anywhere. What was the, the last part of that question again? Where's the middle ground in today's left to right political spectrum? Okay, the, well, the middle ground is, is being honest about what's actually going on at the state capitol and then sticking with that. And here's the problem, if you want to say right, because language is important, but I would, I would urge everybody to research Aaron Von Ellinger and, and the rape conviction that he just had and why that makes us look as if you, were de you described and us as a group that's from middle, le middle to right. And that's a really important thing. And, and that comes, the reason that we have these kinds of distinctions about us is because we're not honest as, a, as an entire group on the right and we like to pit one group against the other to mediate the middle, or we want to create a, a situation where we've carved our own political power out when we don't actually have the ability to accomplish things in the legislature. And so then it becomes a bunch of games, and the people that know what's going on on the inside know that there are people that deserve uh, what's being talked about them. Yeah, middle ground. Uh, <clears throat> you know, there is. I don't think there is any middle ground. Uh, I heard some. I heard one of the candidates in the previous forum talk about uh, there's conservative or Republicans and Democrats. Uh, we. This is the way I view it. This is the world according to Rorick. Uh, there are. We have a two-party system. Unfortunately, it is no longer Democrat. And Republican, it is conservative and socialist. That's it. Those are the two two parties that we've got going on right now. Because the left, uh, well, let me back up. There is the establishment groups that are both in the Democrat side and also in the Republican side. They are the they are the people that are trying to buy for control and control the candidates by throwing pack money at them by getting by getting together and doing these uh, consortiums to try and get one person elected over another person, I don't think there's any middle ground right now. I do agree with Travis that the way that we mitigate that is through honest and hardworking candidates. Yeah, the middle ground's kind of been destroyed. Um, and anybody who wants to call me right wing or a redoubter, I, I'm cool with that. Uh, I think we need more people that are right wing and they are ultra nationalist or ultra conservative. Uh, because the left has pushed us so far over that if you're anything but a socialist, you're, you're not, uh, not going to be accepted by them. They're going to try and kowtow you into accepting their 64 pronouns or whatever, their, their genders and stuff. Or they're going to try and make you accept the, you know, the just the degenerate stuff they're pushing on our kids in the libraries and in the schools now. And if you don't accept that stuff, they're going to go after you. So they haven't left any reasonable ground left. We have to we have to get to the point where we're pushing them back the other direction. And the only way to push them back the other direction is to go far to the right and push 
back. We've got to push back some of this leftist garbage that they've forced down our throats. Okay, you got rebuttal time, Spencer? Uh, no. Adam? No. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I would like to make the distinction with PACs. So PACs are one group, but in that group there's a subset of groups. And so the, the PACs that I was referring to are PACs that nobody knows who's on the board, nobody knows who's controlling it, and, and even though you, the money is supposed to be reported, it filters in. There's, a, there's about five PACs deep right now from Texas into uh, Idaho and then down through Idaho to get to the local PACs. The local PACs don't even necessarily know what that is. Farm Bureau also is a PAC, but it has uh, people that meet across the entire state and even the nation, and they meet and deliberate over policy issues, and they're created in public in an open environment. So you can look at that and say, that's not gonna change, or it's gonna change very slow, and, and those guys, it, they're, they are what they are, it's an open book. And I agree with most of Farm Bureau, if not all of Farm Bureau's policies. So those are the distinctions between those PACs. And I did take uh, Farm Bureau money uh, in agri -PAC, uh, but not any PACs where I don't know who's on the board. Am yeah. I allowed? Do you want to defer? Yes, please. Okay about how we can push back against this. I agree, as I said first, that we do not have a middle ground, but we can't, we can't push the left more, we can't pull them more towards us by being more to the right. We just have to stand our ground, stand on the principles that we all believe in, and stand on the Constitution, and we the people can only push back by having a convention of states and getting the federal government out of our business. All right, this is a short question. This is a true or false. Oh, wait, sorry, this is a yes or no. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong one, I was getting ahead of myself. Do you think the chair of, of a committee should be able to prevent bills from being heard? This is yes or no. Where are we starting? With me? Yep. Uh, they should, no, my, no, they should not be preventing bills from being heard, but that's a long question. It requires a lot more explanation. Nope. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you. Long question. What is an oath and what happens when you break it? That's for, well, an oath to uphold the Constitution. Um, you, well, you shouldn't, uh, you should never break an oath and you should be held accountable by, should be held, held accountable by your peers and people around you and uh, yeah, you should never break an oath. I don't know what the premise behind or what oath it is. People take different different oaths all the time. In the context of your job. Oh, with the with the job. I don't know that there's uh, any punishment for breaking an oath, but the citizens need to watch and understand what's going on and and get unelect you if you don't uphold your oath of office. Mm -hmm. Are we going down the yes. Well. <clears throat> I don't know how many of you are uh, ex-military or ex-law enforcement or current, uh, but I took an oath to uphold the Constitution and the rule of law when I became a police officer. Uh, and to me, that oath means one thing. It's, it's promise to myself, between myself and God, uh, that I, so help me God, will uphold the rule of law and to defend the Constitution of the United States. Should there be consequences for breaking that oath? Absolutely. Very rarely are there consequences for breaking that oath. Um, 
in, in the context of the job, as you're talking about, uh, the citizens are the people, are the gatekeeper. If you break the oath, then the citizens should vote you out. Now, if you're, if you're unethical, immoral, or illegal, you should face the consequences of, of law. There should be no free pass. There should be no, <coughs> no government official right now. I know he's going to give me the hook. There should be no government official right now that is able to walk freely like the Pelosi's of the world, like the Bedke's of the world, like the Littles of the world, that are just committing wanton crime and getting away with it. They should be held accountable. Uh, yeah, I took an oath too. Um, I took an oath when I went in the Marine Corps. And one of the things that really disturbs me about the people who represent us these days is that they take the oath and then they, you know, crumple it up into a little ball and throw it in the trash and do whatever they want to do. And they don't get held accountable for it. And I think that if you take an oath and you break your oath, I think there should be some kind of trial and I think you should go to jail. Uh, if you're not going to follow the oath you took, I mean, that's how we got where we are. People take the oath and they break it without even thinking about it because there are no consequences when they break their oath. And there should be a consequence. I mean, they should be terrified of breaking that oath. They should be terrified of crowd the citizen coming outside their door with, you know, torches and pitchforks, or they should be afraid of going to jail. And right now, since none of them are afraid of any of that, they just do whatever they want to us. And nothing happens to them. You know, if we lie to them, we go to jail. If they lie to us, they get elected again. I wish I had a nice deep voice like these gentlemen do, but I, I used to be able to yell with the best, but not anymore. Anyway, here's the story with that. If you take an oath, you should never break it. And I don't care if there are any consequences right here on earth, you're going to face consequences later on. I don't care what you think, there's no escaping God. And in my family, we took an oath to uphold the Constitution when each of us was eight years old. And I have never broken an oath. I will never break an oath. And if I ever did, I hope you come not with, with pitchforks. I hope you just string me up, because I'm not going to do it. <laughs> bottle time? Pardon? You get 30 seconds of bottle time? I don't care. Thanks. Uh, uh, real quick, I agree with her on that. Uh, I've actually told some people in the shop, I said, you know, if I get to Boise and you see me disobeying the oath or you see me breaking my promises, hunt me down and kill me, please. Because I'm there to serve you, and if I'm not doing the job, I'm no better than the rest of these people. I think they should go to jail for it, and if I do it, I should go to jail for it. I had my rebuttal time on the front end. So, so I want to run off of what something that Spencer says is no accountability. Actually, there is accountability. But what what most people that I've talked to in the district don't understand about some of the accountability functions that we did have uh, last year, and it, I, I, I can't stress it enough, there was a guy that raped a girl in the Capitol, and he was held, he, they, they put a, a hearing up, and he, it, was, it wasn't a trial, but they said, hey, your, your actions are unbecoming of a legislator. It was the fourth girl that had had a problem with this guy. And it put a huge uh, uh, fracture in the party. And part of the group uh, down there used it as a political weapon. And I think everybody should apologize for rep to Representative Dixon because he's held himself in high regard and he, he conducted those hearings. They helped. They found this uh, Aaron Von Ellinger juror to be um, his uh, his actions were unbecoming of a legislator. He just got convicted yesterday of rape, and he's going to prison. He's going to be sentenced in. This, uh, and I'm, I'm glad that justice was served, but the, the 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 lady's life was disrupted. She was jeered inside of the committee hearing. Uh, other groups uh, here. I, I'm, I don't know if anybody wants names, but I've got the names of the people that were part of that. It makes me sick. I've got uh, two young girls that are younger than this girl, and if anybody was there next to this guy, standing next to me, they would think we're the same age. 
So this is what happens, and that's why the accountability part needs to be there, and we do have that process, but it doesn't always fit with the political people involved. So uh, even when the process uh, uh, is working, uh, other people are uh, uh, trying to, to uh, run it amok. legislation go to the floor for discussion and vote how much time do I got because this, this, is, this <laughs> is an hour-long answer I mean yeah. uh, am I in favor of bypassing the committee process no because n bills are, are like buses uh, you know you don't have to get on every one that comes by and take it to the floor for a vote uh, I think the committee process is hugely important because there are there are things that are in those bills that are hammered out in those committees. Uh, should the bills, if they pass the committee, come come to the floor? Absolutely. If a bill is able to make it through the committee and be hammered out so that it's it's something that is viable, it shouldn't be determined whether or not it's going to come to the floor. It should be an automatic it comes to the floor for a vote. There needs to be a mechanism in place where these bills come to the floor and be heard. And unfortunately, there are people that are in charge of the Senate, there are people that are in charge of, of the House that grab a hold of these things and due to calendaring or due to you know being late in the session, they throw them in the drawer, whatever the excuse is, and it doesn't get heard. And that's a travesty because there's a ton of good bills that are out there that should have come to the floor for a vote. Uh, I don't think that any bill should be held off the floor. Um, the committees are where the bills go to die. That's where the people that get selected in these committees can just stomp on a bill and throw it in a drawer and nobody ever hears about it. So if the committees stopped doing that and if all the bills made it to the floor, yeah, are we going to get some bad ones? Of course. But we're also going to get to see everything, and some of the stuff that is good that they hide in the drawers and they never let get to a vote, we're going to get to see that too, and they're going to have to vote on it. And a lot of these bills, they hide them in drawers and never vote on them, so they never have to be on record as voting for or against something. And the more bills that these people vote on, the better idea we get as to what kind of person they are and what kind of representative they are. So the more bills that make it to the floor and the more votes that happen, the more we know and the more we'll get to see them operate. So I think there shouldn't be any bills that get held up in committee like that. There are thousands of bills that come before the state Senate, I'm sorry, legislature. And a lot of really excellent bills get passed out of committees and are approved by the state legislature. And then it is the state senators who will not pass it. That's where not just rhinos, but I mean, they're pure Democrats and they're socialists and they are there not allowing good bills to get passed and signed by the governor. And when we talk about the governor, he should, he should really start doing what he says he's going to and not just, not just sign bills because he wants to get reelected. He's not a good egg. I'm not going to eat him. <laughs> I'm, I'm really glad that you asked this question. Uh, I spent about six or seven years working to rewrite the, the rules that, that uh, pertain to how a bill comes into a committee and then gets onto the floor. But I want to clear up some misconceptions. There's two types of bills, and what you're hearing is talking points right now that are saying that that hey these bills are going in a drawer well all of that is fundraising mechanisms 
Um, not all of it. Most of it is fundraising mechanisms. A lot of the actual bills are, are not held in the way that they're being set. So basically what it is, you have a personal bill and pick the wildest idea, whatever you want, and you, you fundraise on it and you, you get money. You can go and you can get that bill printed and you can show everybody that donated money to you. We're doing this. It's great. It, it goes around a process that, uh, that needs to be there, which is it's hashed out. A, a regular bill, uh, the other misnomer is, is you get it to a committee and somehow you get it passed. No, I've worked on things for five or six years and they come into a committee and then they're done. It's, it's, that's the smallest part. All of the work happens by getting support for your idea, by talking to all of the other legislators. It takes a long time. You don't just bring it to the committee and run it through. So, but, so that's a big misnomer. But for instance, this grocery tax bill where they were saying, hey, this bill's held in committee. I bet you nobody here realizes that that bill kept the money that you get, the return, yet got rid of the tax. That's not a conservative principle. There's major issues with it. It didn't go through any processes. Nobody vetted it. It was just designed to raise money and make it look like somebody voted against it 27 times. And that's a real disgrace to, to our system and the people who want to use those issues to fundraise on and have no intention of actually accomplishing or passing that bill. I was there when it was passed or tried to pass. It was not a, a, an attempted to pass, and that's what the committee structure is for. Travis, can we have? I, I do want to say, if we keep going over the time limit, then you're being unfair to the other candidates. So if we could stick to the red light time limit, that'd be great. I'll, I'll try to force that. There's a lot of information in a short amount of time. That's Same for all of us. Yeah, we're all on the same rules, right? Yep. Life can be hard. They can. Okay, so <laughs> last one to answer? Rebuttal time? Mm -hmm. oh. are, are we going are we going reverse order? Reverse order? So Cindy and Oh I I'm sorry. I thirty seconds. I don't like to go in reverse order. <laughs> I like to go straight forward on everything. I just want you to know that there are, what Travis did say that's correct, is there are some really, you know, the fundraising issue is, you know, I want to look good to get reelected. Well, one thing is, I'm never going to ask you to reelect me because I am in this for the short haul, four years at the most. I don't want to become governor or president or anything else. So let's just try and keep the, uh, keep the bills coming that we want and not have all these fancy bills that no one wants. I think the more bills that make it to the floor and the more votes that happen, it's just a more transparent government. You know, if the more that we see, the more that we'll be able to decide how these people are representing us. So that's my thought behind not letting these things be buried in the committees. The more we see, the more information we have, the better decisions we can make. Um, I think it's a little bit of a misnomer uh, to say things are getting thrown in a drawer, uh, but that is, that's the terminology that's out there being used. It's a very complicated process, it's a long drawn out process on how bills actually come to the floor and, and work their way through a committee. I think they need to work through the committee in order to hammer out the details so that it's beneficial for the citizens of, of Idaho. All right. Uh, okay. So, Speed Round. Which is, uh, would you support a parent's bill of rights in Idaho similar to what passed in Florida? Yes or no? Yes. 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 All right. Longer question. So, uh, we hear some candidates say elections have consequences. So does inaction. In years past, conservatives refused to engage in what they term cultural issues, choosing to focus on things like tax cuts and defense spending. Meanwhile, the left has been running the table on cultural issues, from sexualization of small children in classrooms to race relations that are now at an all-time low. 
it's a culture war at this point. How will you engage with these issues in Boise? Culture issues are a mess. They're designed to be a mess. Um, they're designed to force you to have an opinion that they can pick on you for. Uh, you know, what do you mean you don't support X, Y, Z, pick something? You know, that's how the left has designed these issues and that's how they continue to push things to the left. So I think the most important thing, like, and this is a reoccurring theme with me here, I think the most important thing is that we get information and truth out. You know, when, uh, when they engage in cultural issues, you know, I'll pick on one that especially disgusts me. And that's them, the culture issue of them letting little children decide that they're not what they were born as. Um, that's a cultural issue that I think is beyond the pale. Um, when they have little kids that are telling, or that the parents are saying, my little boy is a little girl and we need to cut pieces and parts off of him, you know, we need to push back on this stuff and we need to push hard. Uh, I think doctors who do things like that should go to jail. Uh, if you're cutting little pieces off a kid, you need to go to jail. I certainly agree with Spencer on that. But there are things going on in our classrooms and in our state that are cultural things and we have to put a stop to it. And we're not going to get a stop to it until we take back our rights from the federal government. And the only way that we can do it when they are so out of control is to have a convention of states. That's the only way that we the people in a get grassroots manner can take back the rights that parents have and everyone else. So I would say that we have to be involved in the cultural wars. There is no doubt about it. I have been teaching as a substitute teacher in the schools up here at all levels, and I can tell you that CRT is in the classroom, Common Core is in the classroom, and they are grooming our children to not just change sexual whatever, but they're also grooming them to be Marxist and socialist. And we have to put a stop to it. Amen. So uh, cultural issues are meant to divide people. Uh, I was at, working at, in the legislature when the Add the Words uh, group was there. Um, it's, it's a complicated issue and one of the big things is, is politics is downstream from society, so it's hard to push it backwards, uh, and it's also difficult to legislate morality, but an open process where people can understand what's going on and get engaged, and don't do cram downs from the state where the local people can have a part in, in decisions that affect their children, affect the education, and, and stay engaged and uh, and pay attention to the process and support the legislators that can help work to push back on this. But as a party too, we need to stop infighting because the infighting takes up all of our, uh, a lot of uh, our energy and we can't spend it on other things. Social issues? Is that what the question's about? The question is, how will you engage with these issues? How will I engage with these issues? Uh, I'm going to engage on what, what, can you guys hear me back there? I'm numb. Yeah. I know I'm getting a little bit more quiet. Anyway, no, I'm fine. <clears throat> Just have to reach into the, the police part of me and talk project at the back. Anyways, uh, how will I engage with them? Is I'm gonna I'm gonna continue to preach. Unfortunately, people don't like this. I'm gonna pe preach morality. I'm gonna start talking about it all the time. Uh, we as as a as a country, we are founded under Christian principles. Those Christian principles have been effectively erased by the socialist class. Uh, we need to get back to principles that are count that are that are government 
and our country was founded upon. I think if we talk truth, we say, it's, we say when something is BS and it goes against what our principles are as a country, we can slowly start to take these things back and get rid of these bills that are coming forward. Uh, these guys are all correct. The, all these things are happening. There is no simple answer, but I'll fight against it. Thirty seconds. You first. Thirty. Oh, thirty seconds. Uh, no, I use my thirty seconds. Nope. Alright, this is a short question, and this one is true or false. Do you believe that the Constitution is a living document subject to changing interpretations? False. Who's going first? You're next. I guess. Oh. It's our, it's our uh, Cynthia is first. Cynthia is first. Yeah, Cynthia is first. You asked it in a way that it's not true or false. It should be yes or no. But it's not a living document. Never has been, never will be, and it never can be, and we can't let it happen that way. And it is happening, and we have to stop it. And the only way is through Article 5, Convention of States. Travis, false. False. Okay. False. Okay. Yes. All right. Long question. Do you believe that it is your job to bring home the bacon to your district? Explain. Okay. Do we understand what bring home the bacon means? I hope so. Yeah, it means bring home the groceries, right? No, I, I know what it means. Is it on? I think you turned it off. It was on one of you. Bring home the bacon means are we going to get along, to I mean, play along, to get along, and, and not listen to what our constituents up here want, and that is conservative values. And I am not going to bring home the bacon the bacon has strings on it. I'm not eating bacon either, but we're not. It's it's a ridiculous thing that we are the we the people are the government, but our government is taking us to the cleaners and it's taking all of our money and spending it on things that we don't want. Is there anyone here who wants what the government is feeding us? No. Anybody? No. Okay, well. We're not going to, uh, I'm not bringing home the bacon, no. Travis? Yes, I'm assuming that that's uh, to go along to get along, which I have been staying since I got into this race that I will not do that. And what I watch is, is the special interest groups are using the issues to generate money and they want to funnel their candidate to further that end. and. It would have been politically expedient for me to join in on that, but I refuse to do that. It's not even a question. So that's why I'm running by myself. I don't have support from, well, I had two thirds of the Republican Central Committee, but it wasn't, it didn't meet the threshold. But generally I'm, I'm running on my own and I will not go to my friends and family that I grew up here and say, hey, give us some money. We're gonna pass this and then knowing very good and well that it's just a fundraising mechanism. I want clarification what you mean by bring home the bacon. Okay. Um, you, you pass legislation or work on legislation that, that brings money into the district that, that um, normally wouldn't come in only because you, you um, work on certain legislation. Did, did y'all hear that back there? No. Here. He, he's, he told his clear. It's on. You want me to restate that? You can restate it so those people can hear it. Okay, the clarification was it's what is bring home the bacon, and, and that is working on legislation that uh, brings in extra dollars into the district that normally wouldn't have happened 
if you didn't work on this legislation. It's just special interest, special money that gets you to vote a certain way on, on legislation that you normally wouldn't do. Okay, so, <clears throat> so in, in terms of that context of, of how he said, no, I'm not going to work on special interest stuff that, that requires me to vote a certain way in order to, to bring money here. But I tell you what I will work on, and I do think that, that we need to be bringing home the bacon for North Idaho. And part of that, pro part of that process, and there is a mechanism in place to take the 64% of federally controlled lands and turning it over to the control of, of, the, of the state of Idaho so that we can start managing our own forests, building jobs, bringing jobs back to North Idaho, growing the timber industry, and, and getting the revenue that that generates for the state to help start pay for these programs. So if that means bringing home the bacon, yes, I'm going to fight for bringing back jobs to Idaho, but I'm not going to give away my vote for special interest groups just and, and, and pander to special interest groups just to bring money here. I want money coming here that will help Idaho grow and become stronger and have families prosper. So any money that comes back here, we pay, right? Or somebody paid. It, it's not just money that came out of nowhere unless it's the money that they've been making up lately. Um, so the main thing that we can do to bring home the bacon as legislators is we can start whittling away at the bloated government that we have. And when you start whittling away at the bloated government, then they don't need as much taxes from us to fund it. You know, Idaho, by law, by its own constitution, is only supposed to have 27 departments. Who knows how many we have? I've told this to some of you, 187. So we've got 160 more departments in the state than are authorized by our own constitution. That costs money. If we didn't have a bean council, a wheat council, a barley council, a potato council, if we were paying for that, they would take less from us in taxes and I wouldn't have to bring any money back here. You'd already have the money. And yes, we do need to take our lands back from the federal government. But the, I'm not saying that we don't need the bean council, but maybe the bean farmers should all get together and have a bean council. Why do we have to pay for it? Yeah. I got more to say. Uh, I, I think that, yes, we need to reduce all those programs in order to, uh, in order to help our, our economy grow. But the thing that I'm thinking about is that we don't necessarily need to eliminate those programs. Those programs are better served by private industry and private uh, practice rather than government practice. It's long been known that, that the citizens can handle and be a better uh, steward of, of money and programs than the federal government is. So we need to bring those programs back into the private sector, which will also help grow our economy. So I guess I didn't understand the question, but I, I, for as far as bringing home the bacon, we do need to take control of and manage our own resource. That's the source of everything. Land, labor, capital is what everything is created from. And having that is essential to uh, expand the economy and then get rid of it, uh, programs that the, the private market can uh, fund themselves. We, we need to reduce those uh, programs Dan's going to get lots of exercise today because of me. All my life. <laughs> 30 seconds. Okay, here we go. First, I have to take a breath. We have to stop all the stuff that's going on. We have paid the taxes already. We don't have to keep paying them. And what we have to do is we have to use the resources that we have in our state and all of the things that we want to control that all of you pretty much agree on with us is that we don't want the federal government taking all of that money and charging us so much but the only way to do it is we have to start at the federal government and stop them so i know i sound like a broken record but we have to start there so if anyone doesn't understand that please talk to me
this first? Travis. Travis. Do you support a voucher system or money to follow the students? Yes. yes. Or no? Yep. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And a longer question. Are you satisfied with the amount of federal dollars being injected into our state budget, or would you want to increase or decrease that amount? Can you say that again? I can repeat it. Please. Are you satisfied with the amount of federal dollars being injected into our state budget, or would you want to increase or decrease that amount? Is that me? You're first. She just wanted to repeat it. Oh, we need to. Uh get wean ourselves off of federal money and we need to uh, be uh, self-sustaining as a state because that money comes with different things that uh, end up getting imported into code uh, different processes that happen as a result of it and it's ine inefficient we're giving money to them so they can funnel it through their bureaucracies to dribble some of it back to us but we have a, a lot of resource in the state and we can utilize that for our own purposes I want to decrease it absolutely uh, we do not need federal money coming into our state Idaho is the richest state in the nation we've got oil we've got timber we've got gems there's no reason why we should have to rely on federal government money with all the strings that are attached with a lot of it to come into our uh, state and, and meddle with our school systems and while we're talking about federal money, the, the big problem with federal money right now is they're bypassing the legislature altogether. They're dumping money right into our schools that doesn't even, that isn't even controlled by the legislature. And the legislature is the one that should be controlling it. So we need to get back to where we are in control of our state. Yes, we need to get rid of the federal government's money. It's going to hurt. It's going to suck. But it needs to happen. We need to be out from underneath the federal government. We need to live within our means. You know, we all live within budgets. We all live within our means, or we try to. And the state of Idaho needs to do that too. Did anybody look, did anybody take the time to look at the state of Idaho's budget this year? Did anybody read through the documents? It's pretty disgusting. Uh, some of the departments got a 100% increase in their budget. And a lot of this was funded by this federal money. We hired, the state of Idaho hired, I want to say hundreds of full-time employees on money that was a one-time injection. So what happens next year? They're gonna expect us to pay for that or they're gonna fire these people. And we can't, we can't run our state like that. So we shouldn't have taken this money to begin with. We should wean ourselves off of it. And we should really figure out a way, I mean, this is like you know, pie in the sky fantasy stuff, but it'd be really nice if our payments we made to the federal government got sifted through the legislature and they said, yeah, you guys really didn't earn it this year. You know, we're gonna keep it this year. <laughs> to decrease it but we need to stop it all together the federal government is supposed to defend our borders they're not doing that all of the problems that are facing our children a lot of them come from not having a sovereign country any longer and we have to stop that so the federal money we don't have to suffer when we get rid of the federal money as one of the intelligent people here on the in this group of candidates said, we have every resource that we have and need to be completely self-sufficient. However, our governor has been selling off natural resources, gold mines, all kinds of our gems and our precious minerals. If we didn't do that, and if we didn't allow him to do it, it would be a whole nother story. We have enough that we don't have to suffer. We don't need the federal government except to defend our borders, and they're not. You get 30 seconds of extra time? I get 30 seconds extra? Wow. <laughs> well, in that case, I'm going to talk about vouchers, because it's not a yes or no question. 
vouchers can happen only if we we take back the education from the federal government. When I was offered the position as Secretary of Education from President Trump, I turned it down. I said, if I were in that position, what I would do is I would, I would get rid of the Department of Education. And we're going to have to do that on the state level too. What, whoever, gets, whoever gets this job, whichever one of us gets elected, our job is to protect you from the federal government. We're supposed to keep them from interfering in your lives. We're supposed to represent you and let you live the life that you want to live according to what you tell us, you know, the rules that you want to live by, that you tell us to live, that you want to live by. And we need to keep the feds out of our lives. And <coughs> I think that a big part of the job is just saying no to this money and to the people in the lobbyist groups that encourage us to take the money to benefit them or their clients. Speed round. Which is the more important virtue in a person running for office? Skill or honesty? Who's oh, that first? I don't know who's first. Who's first? Be well, honest. Who first last night? I think, I think I yeah, you yeah, I think Adam. Adam's Okay, what's, what's the two choices? Skill or honesty? Honest. Honesty. Honesty. I don't think they have to be divided. I'm going to use both. Sorry. Honesty first, but look for somebody with skill also. Otherwise, they won't get anything done. Fair enough. Uh, that brings me to my law question. So there are many committees in our legislative house in Boise, state affairs, judicial, joint committee, ethics committee, local government, resource and conservation, revenue and taxation, agriculture, transportation, business and insurance, ways and means. Name the committee that you most want to be on and which of your strengths would you put forward so the speaker of the house would want you on it and which would you decline because it is a poor match to your experience and ability. Good. Um, I would be fine sitting on any of the committees. I've, I've had a lot of life experience. I was, I've been self-employed since I was uh, 20 years old, and I've had all uh, numerous things through business, uh, through engaging with customers. Uh, my kids are in the education. Uh, it's. Uh, I think I was 21 years old when I started my company. It was in '94. Anyway. Um, but business would probably would be one or and state affairs and I'd also like to be on the committee of uh, federalism because that's a, a committee that that uh, pushes back against the federal government uh, and their mandates uh, and, and brings that, those issues to the legislature uh, representative Dixon's the chair of that and I would ask him if I could also be on that committee <laughs> Well, I think it would be an honor to be on any committee, and I like to think that, that my morals and ethics and my, my training as a, uh, as a police officer would lend me well to the ethics uh, committee. However, uh, I think we need good people that have those skills on every committee. So therefore, uh, I don't really have a preference. I want to do the job for the people and take what they need, the people in North Idaho, uh, when they call me and say, I've got this issue, I'm going to go to whatever committee it is or go to whatever agency it is and, and start talking on behalf of those citizens. Um, part, part of the problem with uh, politics right now, and I, I will tell you, I dislike politics, all right? Uh, there's there's too many slimy peepee, people that are in the middle of, of all this nonsense that's going on. Uh, I have a strong ethical and moral character. Uh, I think that I'm going to be able to take and and uh, take the wishes of the people of North Idaho and put forward the, their voice 
within the legislature? So a little bit different answer. Um, I'm not buried in what all the committees do. Um, I haven't, I just haven't really looked into it that much. I plan on going down and joining the Liberty Legislators and most of those people are going to be people who have done this job for a few years and I'm going to ask them where can I be of the most help? Uh, where do you see me being the most useful to you? And I'm going to take their advice and try and get on those particular committees. Uh, just because I'm a Liberty guy and a truthful guy, honestly, the way the uh, leadership in the, uh, the House is right now, they're not going to want me on any committee. Um, they just, they, they won't. I mean, so I'm going to try and get on whatever committee the Liberty legislators think I'm going to be the most useful on and try and do the best job I can for you folks. I think that education is where I can do the most good immediately because I have a practical plan that I have put forth in education in all Democrat states where I lived and fought for conservative ideals. And I was responsible for getting Republican, the first Republican woman, she just happened to be a woman, first Republican in Hawaii in spite of it being Democrats. So I was remorse for that, that I wasted my money and my time getting them elected. But someone that is in the state legislature is the go-between you and us, we the people, and the federal government. And I'm the one who can do it. Oh, rebuttal of myself? Rebuttal of anyone else? No? I'll rebut myself. <laughs> Take 30 seconds extra. Okay, so getting back to the vouchers and my system, I, I, have, I have studied all of the states, every single one of them, been involved with the Freedom Found, uh, Freedmen, as in Milton Friedman Foundation, and that they keep track of all the states with school choice and vouchers. In 2020, the Supreme Court happened to have a case that will allow us the missing piece so that parents can be in control and take the money, not, not from the state to the, to the public schools, but to the parents, and then we choose where it goes. And free enterprise is going to work for the United, not just for the United States, but in schooling and in the state of Idaho. There's, we're all applying for a job here, right? And there's two kind of jobs that you generally go into. You go in and you're being hired to run a company or be in charge of something, or you're being hired as one of the people that's doing the work. And I look at this job as one of the people that's doing the work. When you get hired to go run something, you go in full bore and you know, you're, putting, you're putting your message out and you're telling people what you want to do. When you get hired to go do some work, the first thing you need to do with that job is be quiet, listen to what people say, listen to what people do, and learn the system and learn how you can be effective and do a good job. All right, you know, and self-reflection is a good thing. That last answer was horrible, I'm telling you. It was, anyways, uh, what, what I think I need to be doing is, is continuing to push forward with my, my, my values <laughs> and my conviction with, with following the Constitution, both of the Constitution of Idaho and also the Constitution of the United States. It's been my experience that people don't like me uh, in, in leadership roles uh, certain times because I can't be controlled. I say what I mean, I, I'm truthful, and I tell it like it is. I don't know what committee I'm going to be on, but that's what they're going to get. They're going to get what you guys tell me that you want. They're going to get all of it. So this is a job interview, and I spent the last 10 years uh, learning to understand it. So when I go down to uh, the state capitol, I'll already know. But I wanted to clear up a misconception. So the Liberty legislators don't determine what committee you're going to be on. That's determined by leadership. Now, leadership's going to change this year. 
and that's going to help with the negotiation process that I've been working on for a number of years, which is to change that process in the committees so that we can have more voices heard. And I've already started that uh, process through uh, working with the other candidates that are there trying to get uh, uh, support for that idea because that's ultimately how you win it is you speak to it and get support uh, for your ideas. And I think we can get that changed. All right. Okay. If you were not a candidate in this race, who would you support? Uh, well, that's pretty simple. I wrote about that on my website. The whole reason I'm running is because when I looked at the field of candidates, I didn't see anybody I could support. None of us? No, <laughs> none of you. You know, that's a BS answer. I don't care. And this might be the short answer, but it's because you do not wish to see the truth. So I would support, not you, but I would support Adam, and the next person I would support is Travis, and the last person I would support is Spencer. Well, I, that's a good question. I, I, I like Adam, I wish he had, was, uh, lived here longer and he would get involved and, and try to understand what we do. I, I like that, and I like Cynthia. I like her ideas on education. So that would, uh, those would be my first two choices, and the last two choices. Speed round, Speed round huh? <laughs> I, t I, I tell you, uh, who would I support? If I wasn't running, uh, I don't know. <laughs> it's not. It's not a cop out. I mean, I I don't have more than one or two words to answer that for. So okay. So Travis, thirty seconds. To your butt. Cynthia, we're not. This, this is a short oh, yeah, answer. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a short round. I got mixed up. Sorry about that. But if you insist. No. no. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> This is concerning school districts, but this question can also apply to the city and county levels as well. What is your position on unfunded mandates, and do you know what impact they have? That's to be right. Yes. No, no, you first, last time. Oh. I'm first again? Yep. We're all bringing stuff to you right now. There you go. Thank you. Does anyone have any money for me? <laughs> unfunded mon mandates. There is no such thing as an unfunded mandate. It's going to cost someone something, and unfunded mandates are going to cost you and you and you and you and you and me and everyone in this room and everyone in our state and everyone in our district. So that's my long and short answer. There is no such thing. I don't want them. There is, I'm not going to allow them to happen. And since I have a couple seconds left, I'm going to say that when it comes to have to sit and listen, you can sit and listen for years. Our country is in dire trouble. We don't have time to wait for years for things to happen. We need people who are going to fight, who are going to be the watchdogs for all of you. I am that person. I, my eagle eye, is going to take care of what we all want. For the clarification of these unfunded mandates being legislation that's, that's put out there that forces the city or county to, to do something without resource. Yeah. City, counts, city, county, or school districts. That's correct. Well, there, no, there shouldn't be any uh, anything like that, and it takes a, a lot of coordination between the counties and the legislature to understand how the impacts of this, any legislation is going to affect them and their budget. But at uh, times, and it has happened, and that's what puts the odds against the 
commissioners against the legislators is there'll be a cram down where they just force the counties into some uh, something that they can't handle. So no, I don't support that, and, and those shouldn't come up. And coordination and working through legislation and informing everybody of how that is going to impact it is the way to get around that. Uh, you want me to restate your question? Yeah, please. I'm sorry. Okay. What is your position of unfunded mandates? Do you know what impact they have? This could be from school districts, city, or county levels. All right. Uh, I, I don't support unfunded mandates. I, uh, Anything that comes from the government, we have to be able to pay for it one way or another. If we're, we're passing it on saying that this needs to happen, uh, whether it's a school district or whether the county, they're going to turn around and look, well, where's the money coming from? Uh, so it needs, it needs to be funded. So I'm not going to support unfunded mandates if, if I can help it. How, how it affects the minutia, you know, I don't know. It depends on the, it depends on the mandate. Uh, more often than not, it, it, in my opinion, is that it creates too much strife and too much stress on, on the organization that has this mandate being given to it. And it causes them to do uh, things that are unpopular, cut programs that are popular in order to be able to fund this unfunded mandate. So, you know, at some point in time, it's going to get funded, but at to what end? And that's what we really need to be looking at. So I, I don't agree with any kind of unfunded mandates. Um, it's bad enough that they tell us what to do, that they tell us what to do and then say, find your own money to do it is even worse. That means that money that is gonna fund this unfunded mandate is gonna suck from some other program. And that's not fair. Uh, people make budgets or organizations make budgets. And when you make a budget and you are barely getting by on the budget that you have, which most of these organizations in theory should barely be getting to buy on the budget that they have they shouldn't have a bunch of extra money so you can't be throwing extra mandates on them and tell them they have to do something because they're going to already have their budget laid out and we're going to steal from some part of their budget to make them do something that we just think they should do but we're not um, able to find the money or willing to find the money to help them pay for it Travis, rebuttal? Do you want rebuttal? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So we're starting with Travis, right? Oh, I thought we get Cynthia one. Oh, first? Yeah. What? Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, I thought it was first. Not me. <laughs> we did. Yeah, okay. Sorry. Speed round. What's the price of a gallon of milk? <laughs> Too much. I don't drink milk, so I don't know. Okay. Don't tell them. I have no idea. I think we're up to like five bucks now, aren't we? Okay. Five dollars the kind of milk I drink, which is local. All right. Long question. Why should small business owners support your campaign? Everybody hear that? Mm -hmm. okay. Well, I want to. Uh, continue to work to reduce regulation and make it easier to produce and, and work. So that's my goal. I don't, I don't, the government's not in the business of picking and winners and losers. It, well, it has become in the business of picking winners and losers, but it should not be in that business. So that's why I don't look for uh, big business donations because they're the first ones with the lobby groups that can uh, make that happen, basically placing them first in line or changing the rules and regulations uh, to favor them, but for small business, small, small businesses, the regulation should be reduced uh, so that everybody uh, can compete and work and not have uh, the extra burden. So the reason why small businesses should support my campaign is, is a couple of different things. First of all, I'm always going to fight for the small business. Having been a small business owner, uh, for several years having uh, run a successful construction business. I understand business. I understand contracts. I understand contract law. Uh, 
and I also understand regulations that will stifle a business. But one of the main things why people should be voting for me and supporting my campaign is that the death of small business has come about solely because Brad Little enacted an emergency mask mandate and it killed our businesses. It killed all our small businesses with, with having them closed down and they don't have the money, the vast coppers, in order to keep themselves employed. And then they started throwing money at people where now they're getting paid to sit at home and they don't want to work. I'm not going to vote for any mandates. I'm going to fight against mandates. I'm going to fight to keep our small businesses open. I'm going to fight to reduce regulations so that our economy can grow, so that our students who are graduating will feel that they can actually make a living here and stay here in North Idaho. The small businesses used to be um, a huge part of the lifeblood of this country. And over the last I don't know. It's probably taken, what, 30 years for Walmart to drive basically every little Ma and Pa store that sold the various things that Walmart sells to drive them out of business. And I don't think that's a good thing. I don't think our world's a better place. I don't like going to, I don't know, some of you are old enough to remember when you went to different towns, you saw different things. And now when you go to different towns, you see pretty much all the same stuff. And that's because they've driven out so much small business. And that's not something that I think is healthy for the nation. And being a small business owner for more than half my life, um, these are the kind of people that I understand their problems. You know, if you've never had to make a payroll in a small business, you don't know what stress is, and you just don't understand it. If you've never had to pay a vendor when business isn't so good, you just don't understand what stress really is when you've got a vendor to pay, and you have employees to pay, and you have taxes to pay. Excess taxes, by the way, excessive taxes. So I will always support small businesses, and I hope they would reciprocate. Please tell me you're not going to read that out loud. Yes, I am. Oh, boy. <laughs> I have been a small business owner for the last 50 years, including up through and to today. A lot of people don't know that, but when I was 20 years old, I started my first business to put my first husband through medical school so he could put me through. Well, that didn't really happen. But it has provided a living. I do understand what small businesses go through. I've, I've been during times of economic recessions in this country that some of you are too young to remember, but I have been there, done that. I have always stayed open. When I didn't have the money, if I was not getting enough money during those times to pay for employees, I took the profit that I had gotten earlier and I paid them out of my pocket. I believe in small business. I do know the answer to how to keep our young people here and to keep small businesses open. I've done it for 50 years, and I can do it for four more, certainly. This is a yes or no question. Would you support legislation that gives an employee the right to make medical decisions that conflicts with their employer's desires? Yeah. An example would be a COVID vaccine being required for employment at a local coffee shop. Would I support the legislation that protects their rights? That protects the employee's right to make their own medical decisions. Yes. yes. Always. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Near and dear to my heart. All right, uh, this this is my long question. Um, in any political position, there are issues where reason can be applied and moderation is necessary to arrive at a good decision. And there are issues that require principled people to take principled stands. Tom Jefferson said, "In matters of principle, stand like a rock." But not all matters are matters of principle. What kind of voice will yours be? I'd like each of you to name one position in the past legislative session or a future one where you would use a reasoned approach and one where you would stand on principle. Wow. I love that. Amazing. 
All right, I'm going to donate my time to Spencer. <laughs> uh, I, I am very principled, but I'm also uh, able to reason through through issues. Um, I, I can't think of a specific example that went, that happened in the last legislative period, uh, but I will tell you that after working in law enforcement, I learned a lot about uh, being able to hold true to your principles and negotiate through a tense, uh, rapidly unfolding situation to come to a positive conclusion. Uh, there are some things that I am not uh, going to compromise on. I'm not going to compromise on my moral values. I'm not going to compromise on my ethics. I'm not going to do uh, things that are, that are illegal, immoral, and unethical. That's, those are, those are some of those rock ideas that we're talking about. But other than that, I am most willing to sit down and come to a reasonable agreement if that's what the constituents of, of the district want. It doesn't really matter what I want, it's what the people of the district want and what's best that, that will work for them. When they call me and tell me they want X, Y, or Z, it doesn't matter whether I want that to happen or not. My job is to do X, Y, or Z. So the time to be reasonable and have discussions and be flexible is when you're discussing things like budgets and, I don't know, where the roads are going to go or how the roads are going to be built. You know, these aren't moral issues. We can, we can have reasonable discussions on things like that. The time to stand like a rock is when they say, I'm going to, you know, fund something to cut parts off little kids or we're going to, you know, fund abortion clinics or something like that. That's the time when you want to stand like a rock and you don't want to bend whatsoever. Um, and, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff that goes a little this way and a little that way. But for the most part, budgetary things and numbers, those are discussion items. But moral things, things that go against everyone's moral fiber, those are the times when you stand and you don't let the whatever, I don't know, the teachers association or whoever it is that's pushing these ideas. You know, we need to have books in schools that teach little kids about LGBT stuff. No, you don't. There's no middle ground on that, no. Thank you. You're nah, I don't believe in middle grounds either. I believe that Thomas Jefferson was 100% correct. You have to stand like a rock. However, I do not come to any decision without it being reasoned in advance. I do the deep dive. I stay up 20 to 22 hours in a 24 hour period and I study every issue. I study what's going on locally and, the, and in our district and in our state and in our federal government and I keep track of what's going on in all 50 states. I have traveled to all 50 states. My parents wouldn't allow me to go outside of the country till I had and I know what most people really believe in and want. We all want the same things in this room. Some of us are more principled than others. Some of us actually do stand on what we believe. And I think you can be reasonable as well as be principled. But I will not, I will never, ever go against my God-given rights, the Constitution of the United States, and the laws, unless they're unjust. So we're a, a republic, not a democracy, but it's a republic, and it's representatives of the people governing to the Constitution. And the Constitution is a uh, steadfast uh, portion. That's the, the part where you take the stand. And we also have a thing called balance of power. So the governor overreached his balance of power uh, in the last legislative session, and that that is one that you can't take. A, uh, it's not a negotiation, and the, the balance of power is critical. There's another issue right now with the with the executive or the um, judicial branch trying to reach into the uh, legislative branch uh, in the selection of judges. Another blurring of the balance of power. That's what keeps us free and keeps the system working the way that it is. 
So those are the ones where you where, where it's, it's principle all the way. Uh, things like the interchange uh, on the highway, I was I weighed in on that. Those things are negotiated. We're as a republic, we have different representatives. Some of those things uh, are a blending of ideas that come together to formulate what we have. It's not a dictatorship where one person demands it. So those are situations where you uh, negotiate through. Question if we have time for it. Rebuttal? I don't know. <laughs> Is, do we have more questions coming? Spencer, rebuttal? No. Adam? Yes, do we have more questions? No. No. Have more questions. I have one bonus question if, if y'all want it. It can be a yes or no question. That's good. Okay, yes or no. Should tech giants like Facebook, Amazon, and Google be broken up? Yes. Yes or no? I'm thinking. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think that they should be broken up. I think that we the people should have, we either support them or we don't. And if we don't, they should die. And right now they, oh, it's yes or no? <laughs> That's not a yes or no question, but actually Congressman Fulcher and I have been, well he's been working on it, I've been following it, with the tech giants, um, and there's, there's a platform and there's publishers, and they're acting as one and governed as another, and that's where we have the problems we have, so they need to follow uh, along with it's a short answer. So like anyway, that. yeah, it's a long answer. So. I know. It's a very long answer. Yes or no, huh? I thought that's not a yes or no. That's Don't okay. give us essay questions okay. and tell us it's yes or no, you know, okay? Part, I am going to give a short essay question. Part of being principled is you, you have to be able to uh, stand principled even when the answer sucks. No, I don't think they should be broken up. There should be controls and regulations. Things need to be changed. But we are, we are a free country. They have the right to be in business. Rebuttal. Yeah. Hold on. Hold on. Let's go in order. Wait, this is a short answer. We're That's not right. supposed to have rebuttal. Well, why does short answers always seem like long answers? Because they're being asked. I tried. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry. I was trying to stick to the rules. Um, so, if we're going to allow these giant companies to get the monopolistic power that they have, I mean, we learned a lesson back at the turn of the 19th century that these companies do reach a point where they need to be broken up. And anybody that's had to deal with Facebook or Amazon or Google should know that they're at the point where they could really. Not, they really don't care about us, one bit, one iota. So if they're not concerned about the people that they're serving, then they're just in it to, you know, grift from us, take, take whatever they can from us. And if they can afford to buy off all of our politicians that allow them to do this to us so that they don't ever have any regulations that go against them that constrain them, then yeah, they should be broken up. Yeah. <laughs> I have to agree with Adam on this, even though I don't like them and I am not on any social media because of this very fact that they, they have screwed us from one end to the other and they don't allow free speech and anything that I would have to say, they would kick me off in a minute. And even though I think it's a good idea that Twitter is now being owned by Elon Musk. Let's not forget, he's a radical, even though he's acting in a principled way right now. Okay. That's it? Okay. What is this book? The Trump stands, I think. Okay. So uh, we're going to start two minute closings. With the, I'm starting? Yeah, you're starting this two minute closing. We're going that one. I'm sure some of some of you might have noticed that I have this huge tome in front of me. You know the little constitutions that we all carry around and we think that's everything? Well, it isn't. This is the actual constitution 
of the United States. This includes all of the amendments, all of the, all of the things that have been written about it, all of the decisions that have been made in the Supreme Court. This is our Constitution. Y'all see that? I like my short version better. <laughs> so do we. I like the short version also. However, this is what we actually are living under, and we need to protect. It's not a living document. These are how we got amendments. But we, the people, have to stop the federal government, and then the state government, and on down the line. And this is the only way that we can, is from the Constitution. I will never, ever betray the Constitution. I have made a note, and that's, that's the truth. But I'm going to use part of my time to talk about Spencer, someone on the stand. Last week, he told me when I was, my freedom of speech was denied to me, he said, would you come out and talk to me for a minute outside? And he told me that I had to drop out of the race. And you can sit and shake your head if you want to, but that's exactly what you told me to do. Yeah. And are you going to deny it? Oh, no, I asked you to drop out. I asked all these people to drop out. Yeah, well, you know what? You're the one ought to drop out, not us. Okay. We're not trying to get you to drop out. I, I just want there to be truth. If you want truth, I am not anyone's lapdog. My parents taught me to be a watchdog. And I'm going to be a watchdog for you all. And I'm not going to stop. And I'm not going to be quiet. And I've listened and listened for decades. And I've been down in the swamp. William and I moved up here to get away from them. I don't want to be back down there, but I'm doing it because we, the people, need me to be there, and I'm going to be there if you vote for me. So please look at my campaign website that finally got up. It's vote for the number four, votefor.cynthia.us. That stands for United States and us, we the people. Thank you. So like I said earlier, the reason that I ran to begin with is because when I looked at, slate, looked at the slate of candidates and I looked at our past representation that we've had in this area, being Heather Scott, I didn't see anybody that was going to run that I thought would reflect her values and represent us the way that she did. And she thinks I'm going to represent us well because she endorsed me along with a bunch of other folks that are of similar minds. And when I approached all of these people and asked them to drop out, the reason I did that is because the Democrats in this area are doing what they like to do, which is help and support people that have an R next to their name, but they're actually a Democrat. And the Democrats, as we all know, does everybody know that they get out and they register as Republicans and they vote in our primaries, right? So if we're going to defeat that, we can't have one Democrat candidate that's running as a Republican get all of their votes while the four of us split up what's left. Because what's gonna happen is we're gonna end up with a Democrat replacing the great legislator that we had in Heather Scott. So when I ask these guys to consider dropping out, I'm asking them because I think that I've been doing quite well at this, and I think I have the most support, and I think I'll represent everybody the best. And I wouldn't have done it if I didn't think that was true. And if you go look at our questionnaires from the Republican Central Committee, one of the questions they asked is if there's somebody else that's running that you think has a better chance than you, would you drop out? Who knows what I answered that question as? I said yes. It wasn't a complicated answer. I would drop out if I thought I was a bad candidate and I would stop splitting the vote. But I don't think I'm a bad candidate. I think I'm the best candidate. I think I have the best chance of winning. And that's why I asked these people to please look in the mirror, try to consider are you doing as well as you think you are? And if you're not, please drop out and support me so we can beat the Democrat that's trying to steal Heather's seat. Thank you. Can you have some of my time? Yeah, just real quick. Yeah. I don't know what's up with these guys. It's just two minutes. Not up to me. It's your closing statement. Two closing statement. Sorry, Cynthia, I only got two minutes and I'm going to take five. <laughs> I can appreciate him being honest, saying that he contacted all of us. 
uh, that's that's honorable in my in my book. Uh, however, I started running uh, for this seat uh, back in July of last year. Started a little slowly because I lived down in Sago. The line kept flip flopping back and forth. But I think I'm the best candidate for the for the job. I've got the best experience. I've got more than two decades worth of experience within government, uh, dealing with rule of law, dealing with judges, dealing with the legislative, uh, not the legislative, the judicial process. Uh, I understand that. I understand how to teach people, and I'm a proven leader in that realm. When you look at my website, you'll see one endorsement, and it's not Heather Scott. I'm not trading on her name. I'm not going to be like Heather Scott. I'm my own person. I don't follow, I lead. And the way I'm going to lead is like I always do. I'm going to speak my mind. I'm going to say it straight right to you guys. I'm going to listen to what you have to say, and I'm going to take that opinion, and I'm going to work with it down in Boise. The, the, person, the person that endorsed me is my boss from my old job. I, I treasure that endorsement. I worked with that man for a long, long time. He knows me. He's the sheriff of Washington County. I know it's from another state. It's not from a sheriff around here, and that sticks in a lot of people's craw. I don't care. I worked for that man. I put my life on the line for that agency. He sat in my car more than one shift all through the night, and we have long conversations. I respect that man, and I respect the endorsement that he gave me. He said I'm a proven leader and that he could not think of another person that would be good at being a state legislator or any other type of leadership position. That's why I'm running. So I'm running for the legislature not because I like politics. I actually hate politics. I hate the dishonesty. I hate the, the way that the one group is pitted against the other to mediate the middle. Um, I've worked at a lot of legislation. I, I used to take legislation to Heather and, and Sage, and this may come as a surprise to a lot of people. I, I mean, I like Heather, but it's become more about fundraising and less about uh, getting um, legislation passed, and it's all about personalities, and, and so I can't take legislation to her because of the personality conflicts down at the legislature. That's why I'm not endorsed by her, and that's why I'm, I'm so critical of it, because I watch the way things are done, and I say, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to represent the district. I'm not representing groups. We're not raising money to fix problems that we can't fix or that we don't intend to or try to fix. So I that's going to be a surprise to some people. It's going to confirm what some people think and it's going to be exactly what other people know so you got to ask around the district i'll put my reputation up against anybody's i've lived here my uh, my whole life and i've also been involved i've been involved in politics actively volunteering my own time at my own expense making my own trips down um, longer than than anybody else running in the race has even lived in this district or in the state for that matter so i'll uh I would like your vote. I, I mean, it's, it would be politically expedient for me just to go along, to get along, and fall into the same process that's already been built, but I'm not going to do that. I, I, I work on my own. I've never been attached to anybody, and I'm interested in, in representing the district only, and I, I would appreciate your vote, Travis Thompson, for seat 1A. If anybody would like to talk to me about it, I I could talk for hours. I've got years and years of uh, situations that have happened, and it's it makes my stomach turn. So anybody wants to know the details? I'm going to take another time, and I know that I am breaking the rules, but I'm breaking the rules because. This person has just lied no, through his teeth. No, 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 no. I don't no, care, he's you lied. You can't do that. Come on. No. Oh, it's part of the game, but it's That's not right. part of the truth. It, it, I wasn't even in the race when he said Thank that you he, all for coming. I'm sorry, but 
Please thank you all for coming. We, you can we can you talk can. outside because we have to clean up and get out of the library by 5 o'clock. So if you wish to talk up. to anybody outside, you may do thank that. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for coming. I wasn't even in the race. You said you looked around and you didn't find anyone in the race that was honest or that you could Wait, did support I find you. Like you told people lies about me and I have You tell everybody all about this. I will. You do it.